The Persona is a segment of the collective psyche, an essay by Carl Gustav Jung, read by Greg Bothine. And as a note, this is a follow-up essay to one of Jung's essays titled, Phenomena Resulting from the Assimilation of the Unconscious. And I do suggest you either read or listen to that essay before you listen to this one. With that said, here we go. In this chapter, we come to a problem which, if overlooked, is liable to cause the greatest confusion. It will be remembered that in the analysis of the personal unconscious, the first things to be added to consciousness are the personal contents, and I suggested that these contents, which have been repressed but are capable of becoming conscious, should be called the personal unconscious. I also showed that to annex the deeper layers of the unconscious, which I have called the collective unconscious, produces an enlargement of personality leading to the state of inflation. This state is reached by simply continuing the analytical work, as in the case of the young woman discussed above. By continuing the analysis, we add to the personal consciousness certain fundamental, general, and impersonal characteristics of humanity, thereby bringing about the inflation I have just described, which might be regarded as one of the unpleasant consequences of becoming fully conscious. This phenomenon, which results from the extension of consciousness, is in no sense specific to analytical treatment. It occurs whenever people are overpowered by knowledge or by some new realization. Knowledge puffeth up, Paul writes to the Corinthians, for the new knowledge had turned the heads of many, as indeed constantly happens. The inflation has nothing to do with the kind of knowledge, but simply and solely with the fact that any new knowledge can so seize hold of a weak head that he no longer sees and hears anything else. He is hypnotized by it, and instantly believes he has solved the riddle of the universe. But that is equivalent to almighty self-conceit. This process is such a general reaction that in Genesis 2.17, Eating of the tree of knowledge is represented as a deadly sin. It may not be immediately apparent why greater consciousness followed by self-conceit should be such a dangerous thing. Genesis represents the act of becoming conscious as a taboo infringement, as though knowledge meant that a sacrosanct barrier had been impiously overstepped. I think that Genesis is right in so far as every step towards greater consciousness is a kind of Promethean guilt. Through knowledge, the gods are as it were robbed of their fire, that is, Something that was the property of the unconscious powers is torn out of its natural context and subordinated to the whims of the conscious mind. The man who has usurped the new knowledge suffers, however, a transformation or enlargement of consciousness, which no longer resembles that of his fellow men. He has raised himself above the human level of his age. He shall become like unto God, but in so doing has alienated himself from humanity, and pain of this loneliness is the vengeance of the gods, for never again can he return to mankind. He is... As the myth says, chained to the lonely cliffs of the Caucasus, forsaken of God and man. From this point of view, the conscious personality is a more or less arbitrary segment of the collective psyche. It consists in a sum of psychic facts that are felt to be personal. The attribute personal means pertaining exclusively to this particular person. A consciousness that is purely personal stresses its proprietary and original right to its contents with a certain anxiety, and in this way seeks to create a whole. But all the contents that refuse to fit into this hole are either overlooked and forgotten or repressed and denied. This is one way of educating oneself, but it is too arbitrary and too much of a violation. Far too much of our common humanity has to be sacrificed in the interest of an ideal image into which one tries to mold oneself. Hence these purely personal people are always very sensitive, for something may easily happen that will bring into consciousness an unwelcome portion of their real, individual character. This arbitrary segment of collective psyche, often fashioned with considerable pains, I have called a persona. The term persona is really a very appropriate expression for this, for originally it meant a mask once worn by actors to indicate the role they play. If we endeavor to draw a precise distinction between what psychic material should be considered personal and what impersonal, we soon find ourselves in the greatest dilemma, for by definition we have to say of the persona's contents what we have said of the impersonal unconscious, namely, that it is collective. It is only because the persona represents a more or less arbitrary and fortuitous segment of the collective psyche that we can make the mistake of regarding it in toto as something individual. It is, as this name implies, only a mask of the collective psyche, a mask that feigns individuality, making others and oneself believe that one is individual, whereas one is simply acting a role through which the collective psyche speaks. When we analyze the persona, we strip off the mask and discover that what seemed to be individual is at bottom collective. In other words, that the persona was only a mask of the collective psyche. Fundamentally, the persona is nothing real. 
It is a compromise between individual and society as to what a man should appear to be. He takes a name, earns a title, exercises a function. He has this or that. In a certain sense, all this is real. Yet in relation to the essential individuality of the person concerned, it is only a secondary reality, a compromise formation in making which others often have a greater share than he. The persona is a semblance, a two-dimensional reality, to give it a nickname. It would be wrong to leave a matter as it stands without at the same time recognizing that there is, after all, something individual in the peculiar choice and delineation of the persona, and that despite the exclusive identity of the ego consciousness with the persona, the unconscious self, one's real individuality, is always present and makes the self felt indirectly if not directly. Although the ego consciousness is at first identical with the persona, that compromised role in which we parade before the community, yet the unconscious self can never be repressed to the point of extinction. Its influence is chiefly manifest in the special nature of the contrasting and compensating contents of the unconscious. The purely personal attitude of the conscious mind evokes reactions on the part of the unconscious, and these, together with personal repressions, contain the seeds of individual development in the guise of collective fantasies. Through the analysis of the personal unconscious, the conscious mind becomes suffused with collective material, which brings with it the elements of individuality. I'm well aware that this conclusion must be almost unintelligible to anyone not familiar with my views and technique, and particularly so to those who habitually regard the unconscious from the standpoint of Freudian theory. But if the reader will recall my example of the philosophy student, he can form a rough idea of what I mean. At the beginning of the treatment, the patient was quite unconscious of the fact that her relation to her father was a fixation, and that she was therefore seeking a man like her father, whom she could then meet with her intellect. This in itself would not have been a mistake if her intellect had not been that peculiarly protesting character, such as is unfortunately often encountered in intellectual women. Such an intellect is always trying to point out mistakes in others. It is preeminently critical, with a disagreeably personal undertone, yet it always wants to be considered objective. This invariably makes a man bad-tempered, particularly if, as so often happens, the criticism touches on some weak spot which, in the interests of fruitful discussion, were better avoided. But far from wishing the discussion to be fruitful, it is the unfortunate peculiarity of this feminine intellect to seek out a man's weak spots, fasten on them, and exasperate him. This is not usually a conscious aim, but rather has the unconscious purpose of forcing a man into a superior position and thus making him an object of admiration. The man does not, as a rule, notice that he is having the role of the hero thrust upon him. He merely finds her taunt so odious that in the future he will go a long way to avoid meeting the lady. And in the end, the only man who can stand her is the one who gives in at the start, and therefore has nothing wonderful about him. My patient naturally found much to reflect upon in all this, for she had no notion of the game she was playing. Moreover, she still had to gain insight into the regular romance that had been enacted between her and her father ever since childhood. It would lead us too far to describe in detail how, from her earliest years, with unconscious sympathy, she had played upon the shadow side of her father, which her mother never saw, and how, far in advance of her years, she became her mother's rival. All this came to light in the analysis of the personal unconscious. Since, Chantry. if only for Go professional judge. reasons, I could not allow myself to be irritated, I inevitably became the hero and father lover. The transference, too, consisted at first of contents from the personal unconscious. My role as a hero was just a sham, and so, as it turned me into the merest phantom, she was able to play her traditional role of the supremely wise, very grown-up, all-understanding mother-daughter beloved, an empty role, a persona behind her which real and authentic fiend, her individual self, lay hidden. Indeed, to the extent that she had first completely identified herself with the role, she was altogether unconscious of her real self. She was still in her nebulous infantile world and had not yet discovered the real world at all. But as, through progressive analysis, she became conscious of the nature of her transference, the dreams I spoke of in chapter one began to materialize. They brought up bits of the collective unconscious, and that was the end of her infantile world and of all the heroics. She came to herself and to her own real potentialities. This is roughly the way things go in most cases, if the analysis is carried far enough that the consciousness of her individuality should coincide exactly with the reactivation of an archaic god image is not just an isolated coincidence, but a very frequent occurrence which, in my view, corresponds to an unconscious law. After this digression, let us turn back to our early reflections. Once the personal repressions are lifted, the individuality and the collective psyche begin to emerge in a coalescent state, 
thus releasing the hitherto repressed personal fantasies. The fantasies and dreams which now appear assume a somewhat different aspect. An infallible sign of collective images seems to be the appearance of the cosmic element, i.e., the images in the dream or fantasy are connected with cosmic qualities, such as temporal and spatial infinity, enormous speed and extension of movement, astrological associations, telluric, lunar, and solar analogies, changes in the proportions of the body, etc. The obvious occurrence of mythological and religious motifs in a dream also points to the activity of the collective unconscious. The collective element is very often announced by peculiar symptoms, as for example by dreams where the dreamer is flying through space like a comet, or feels that he is the earth, or the sun, or a star, or else is of immense size, or dwarfishly small, or that he is dead, is in a strange place, is a stranger to himself, confused, mad, etc. Similarly, feelings of disorientation, of dizziness and the like, may appear along with symptoms of inflation. The forces that burst out of the collective psyche have a confusing and blinding effect. One result of the dissolution of the persona is the release of involuntary fantasy, which is apparently nothing else than the specific activity of the collective psyche. This activity throws up contents whose existence one had never suspected before. But as the influence